for this game theory question, you have to know how to read the actual chart and know what dominant strategy is. These game theory charts always look the same. The numbers on the left, the blue numbers, are for the firm on the left. And the numbers on the right, the red ones, are for the firm on the top. So quick question, if both firms priced low, what is the profit of firm two gonna be? It's gonna be $10, right? Low, low, down here, red is firm two, $10. That's how you read the chart. A dominant strategy is the strategy a firm should choose regardless of what their opponent does. So if firm one should always price high all the time, no matter what, then that's their dominant strategy. If they should price high sometimes and low other times, then they don't have a dominant strategy. All right, let's do it. Let's figure out the dominant strategy for firm one. If firm two prices high, firm one can either price high and get $100 or price low and get $80. Which one's better for firm one? Well, $100, the star next to that. If firm two prices low, firm one can go high and get 50 or low and get 20. Which one's better? Well, 50. Now, notice, firm one should always price high. There's no reason ever to price low. If firm two goes high or low, they should always price high. So firm one's dominant strategy is pricing high. That answers the question. But let's go check out firm two. If firm one price is high, firm two can choose between $50 and going low and going $90. Which one would they rather have? They'd rather go low and get $90. If firm one price is low, firm two can choose between $40 pricing high or going low and getting 10. Firm two would rather price high and get $40. Now notice, sometimes firm two is gonna price high, sometimes they would price low, so they do not have a dominant strategy. Dominant strategy is none. For more practice on this concept, check out the unit for responses. Story time! You just finished the unit four multiple choice questions. It's time for a story. You better be actually studying, not just watching all these stories. Now back in the year 2000. In the year 2000! You're probably only gonna get that reference if you're a little older. So in the year 2000, I was just finishing up college and I was living in San Diego, but I also had a motorhome in Mexico. I used to surf a lot when I was younger, and so I had a motorhome there. I'd be able to drive in, park, stay in the motorhome for a couple nights and go ahead and surf at K38. So this one day I packed up my car and I drove a little further south and I went surfing. I spent a couple hours in the water and then I decided to come in. So this was a point break and so there's lots of rocks and a big giant cliff. And as I'm walking back in, I'm carrying my surfboard and I come across a guy who's walking towards me. As he's walking past me, I can tell he's kind of standing out. He's carrying like an empty can and he's in full clothes. I'm just kind of like, why is this guy over here? At about 100 yards away, I kind of step over some rocks and as I land, I look and I see four puppies. And look back to that guy, he is just long gone. Why would this guy come, put these puppies in the beach, and then walk away? And then I figure it out. This guy didn't want his puppies, so he was feeding them on the beach and then he took off so they'd stay at the food, and when the tide come in, they drowned. I know, tell me about it. So I look out, I see the tide coming up, I see these puppies, I see the cliff, I know I gotta do something. So I pick the puppies up, and I've got my surfboard, I got these four puppies, and I go climb this cliff to get back up to my car. When I get back to my car, I meet another American couple who happened to be in the area. I told them the scenario and they said they'd take one of the puppies. So now I only had three left. I drove back to the motorhome, put the puppies in the motorhome and gave them some food. I left the puppies there and then drove up back to San Diego to go get my girlfriend at the time, who ended up being my wife. We drive back into Mexico, I open up the motorhome and say, hey, look what I got. She's like, oh, puppies! So now here's the problem. I've got these three puppies, I live in San Diego, but they're in Mexico. I've got to smuggle them into the country. I didn't want the border patrol to confiscate the dogs, and so instead of just kind of driving them in the back of my seat, we decided to put them in the trunk. Don't worry, no dogs were harmed in this story. So I laid down some blankets, and I put each one of these puppies down in the trunk, and I closed the lid. We drive 15 minutes up to the border. As we're waiting in line, you can hear, oh shoot. If those dogs bark while we're talking to the border patrol guy, we are screwed. Now we're the third car in line, and the border patrol guy asked to see that driver's trunk. He steps out, opens trunk, and looks through it. The whole time we're thinking, we are screwed, we are screwed, we're gonna get caught. Finally, it's our turn. We pull up, we're talking to the border patrol guy. So you spent the night in Mexico, huh? Yeah, that's right. I'll be right back. He walks to the back of the car, puts his hands in the trunk, and pushes down on it to feel like the suspension. He walks up back to the front and says, you two can take off. Thank you! Drive into California, get off the first exit. Go and open up the trunk. There are these three puppies, all just sleeping peacefully. <laughs> Oh, we pick them up and hug them and pet them and give them kisses. They had no idea how much their life just changed. Then we took them to a pet rescue place down in San Diego. Now this all happened around Thanksgiving, so all three of them probably ended up being somebody's Christmas puppies. Ah. Now if you and your family adopted a dog Christmas 2000, go ahead and feel free to contact me. If you're a federal agent with Border Patrol, don't contact me.